It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Well, I stayed at a friend's house just before Christmas, and uh, the friend, many years ago, had been educated at Christchurch College in Oxford. And I woke early, went downstairs, and found in a front room a copy of the current Christchurch Oxford annual magazine, except, strangely, there was no indication at any point in the opening pages or front cover that it was Christchurch Oxford's annual magazine, except instead it kept referring to the house. Now already I can see one or two of you with a wry smile on your face, and that is precisely my point. I'm not suggesting that it's an issue for you, and it certainly wasn't an issue for my friend. I'm hoping to go and stay there again, so I better say that. But, you know, there is a way of human interaction that makes one feel that unless one is part of that little group with its accepted language, inner signs, proper norms, hints, suggestions, that it, one is something of an outsider and really rather inferior. I, I being an ignorant peasant, had absolutely no idea that uh, Christchurch Oxford is called the house for those who are part of it. And, and you could just imagine that uh, anybody who was in the house or at the house, I didn't know, even know how you're supposed to say it, or educated um, under the house, or I don't know what you say, but you can imagine them with this kind of language. Oh, you were at the house. Shortly after Christmas, I was very kindly given this book by uh, somebody in the congregation. They're sitting here at the moment. I won't uh, look in their direction just in case, but the, the the front cover says, am I a chap? Now, now, before I actually sort of read it carefully, I replied, just because I didn't want to be in any sense thought of as inferior, I just replied, dear X, big capital letters, yes. 
yours ever, William Taylor. And that was my thank you letter. But, you know, apparently it's the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you put butter on your bread. I mean, there are any number of things that will tell you whether you're a chap or not. I've always thought that's just a tiny group of people who are kind of past masters of that sort of thing. But the more you observe humanity, the more you realize it's absolutely everywhere. You know, amongst the Extinction Rebellion protesters, you know, there's a hierarchy. Were you at such and such a rally? Speak to our prisons worker. Which prison you attended, which wing you were in, how long you were in for, and what crime you committed? There's kudos. So criminal pride, academic snobbery, social one-upmanship, sporting elitism. And then, then there is that equally grotesque, inverted manifestation of the same thing. H have you noticed the virtue signaling of some? Do you know, I came from such a deprived background. <laughs> it's a kind of caricature of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. We once had a church workers on rough inner city urban estates conference here. And at the conference, the workers from the different estates were kind of almost vying for position, my estate's worse than yours, sort of stuff. And just in case you're thinking, oh, this is only the English, and we are very, very good at the inner ring sort of stuff. Uh, I was abroad. I won't tell you which country, because it'll offend a large section of our congregation. And I was asked this question, how big is London? Oh, about seven million. Ah, second tier city. And then somebody else at the table responded, small second tier city. <laughs> now this morning, no room for pompous pride in the church. No spiritual snobbery here, please. Three very Simple points, spiritual pride and the infantile attitude of some church members and leaders, verses one to four. Spiritual pride and the proper assessment of genuine gospel workers, five through 11. And then spiritual pride and the final recognition of all our labors, 12 through 15. Spiritual pride and the infantile attitude of some church members and workers. I don't know what kind of school report you received over the years. My final report in the last term at school read like this. Taylor has combined his studies merely to the most elementary aspects of this subject, of which he has only a shallow grasp. His contributions in class have been largely disruptive. Paul's report on the Corinthian church, verses one through four, make any scorcher you have received pale into insignificance. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? When one says, I follow Apollos, and another, I follow Paul, are you not being merely human? So, Corinthians, not spiritual, of the flesh, infants, not ready to eat with the grown-ups, still babyish, you don't appear to have gone beyond potty training Let's get you back in nappies. And Paul's assessment is all the more biting because the Corinthian church appear really to consider that they are something. Do you remember last week in verse 6, yet among the mature, among the complete, and they really thought they were complete. They really thought they were spiritual. We discover that. They've reached this level of spiritual maturity. And he says, oh, no, no, the way you're behaving shows that you're still in primary school, if that. 
Rather than wrestle with and feed upon the truth Paul and the apostles brought to them, which is what a spiritual person would do because Paul is bringing them spiritual truth from God because he's an apostle, they dwelt only on surface appearance, presentational style. A oh, great illustration, preacher. You really moved me. And Paul says, you're so childish. And when he says, I fed you with milk, he doesn't mean that there was one set of truth for the new Christians and a deeper set of different truths for the mature. No, it's the same truth. He just, if you like, pitched it at the right level. I fed you with milk. And even now, you're not ready for anything more. So I popped down to uh, the supermarket. Here is a tube of organic Caribbean-style chicken with sweet potato and whole grain rice. It looks absolutely disgusting. But can you imagine sitting down at lunch with the family and mum saying to you, oh, oh, for you, everybody else, roast potatoes, roast beef, and, but, 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 but for you... Um, Organic, simply prune, Sainsbury's little one or Ella's kitchen for you, da, 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 da. You Corinthians, you think you're so grown up? You really should be eating Ella's kitchen. Well, what's the problem? It seems that some church members and leaders have attached themselves to favorite preachers and become so enamored with their favorite preacher's style and ministry that they judge themselves to be better than others because they follow this, that particular individual who they've judged to be a spiritual superstar on the basis of that individual's qualification and style. This partisan attachment to particular celebrity speakers is leading to a party spirit in the church. And the word envy, jealousy, strife, division, shows that they are rivals one with another, they're divided one from another, they stand apart one from another, they puff themselves up one against another, they won't work together. This is the second time of five that Paul mentions himself alongside Apollos. We need to be clear that there are absolutely no theological differences between Paul and Apollos. We do know that Paul Apollos was a brilliant orator. He appeared to have a silver tongue. And he's described in the Acts of the Apostles as a Jew, a native of Alexandria. Alexandria in Egypt was the Harvard of its day. He's described as an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. And so they seem to be puffing themselves up because they're part of Apollos' inner circle or, 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 or Paul's inner circle or whatever, and playing, if you like, spiritual top trumps based on their connection to a particular church or church worker. I suspect that is magnified by the fact that Paul had come to Corinth to start the church and therefore quite wisely had tailored what he taught them to the level they were at, and Apollos had come in a little bit later and given the same material, but in more meaty form. And because Apollos was a skilled speaker, of course, in Corinth there, at the heart of Greek culture, that oratory was highly prized. The problem was entirely with them, not Paul and Apollos. It was pride, divisive, party spirit, it was very serious because it was a mark of infantile childishness. Now, once one begins to see it like that, it's possible to see it depressingly everywhere because we're so human. At granted, it's unlikely that anyone at St. Helens might say, well, I was baptized by William Taylor or by Charlie Screen, Gwilym Davis, Phil Hudson, whatever. Though I did baptize many in the youth group, one of whom was violently sick over me as I baptized them, and I've been forbidden from naming and shaming them, unfortunately. 
But we do find this kind of personal advancement through preferential attachment. I go to such and such a church. I, I download sermons from such and such a website. I've attended such and such a seminary. I went to such and such a camp. As if you're going to work with teenagers <laughs> can make you superior to somebody else. And of course, with the advent of the internet and the proliferation of churches in London, size of church, personality of preacher, age profile of congregation, style of music, ethnic diversity of congregation can all be used. And Paul says of such absurd posturing that it's unspiritual, it's infantile, it's of the flesh, it's teletubby talk, it's human. And it's all the more pathetic because those promoting such party spirit are claiming to be spiritual. That's what's so extraordinary, isn't it? The claim to be spiritual on the basis of something profoundly fleshly, human, and infantile. How then do we avoid such a damning end-of-term assessment? Verses 5 through 11. Spiritual pride and a proper assessment of genuine gospel workers. Now, 5 through 11 are fascinating verses. The whole piece provides a clear job description for anyone paid or otherwise engaged in any kind of Christian work. Two images dominate deliberately so. One is the field, and then at the end, the building. And with so many involved in so much gospel ministry at St. Helens and others listening online, these verses could not be more important. You're used to key performance indicators at work, quantifiable outputs and so forth. Well, these verses give you a proper way of working out what gospel ministry should be like. But the intention of the verses is much more than simply to give us a benchmark for proper Christian work. The intention is to address Corinth in its immature assessment of itself. Look at how Paul describes himself in verses five through seven. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants, he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. Verse five, Paul is a servant. It's the word for a waiter, someone who brings you your food at table and cleans the dishes afterwards. That's the gospel worker. Minimum wage at McDonald's. He's engaged on a task from God. He's an errand boy, as the Lord assigned. Verse five. It's all God's work, verse six, only God gives the growth. He's nothing, verse seven, and nobody, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Only God gives the growth, verse seven. He is equal on a par with every other Christian. He who plants and he who waters are one. He will be rewarded, verse eight, each will receive their award. He's something. God's fellow worker. Do you note that? A servant, a nobody, a nothing, an equal, rewarded God's fellow worker. I think this is absolutely brilliant. Last week, Paul said, I'm an apostle. Do you know, this is really important. The apostolic truth, that's at the foundation of the church, Lord Jesus Christ and his revelation, that's what the church is built on. You must listen to your apostle. This week, I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody, I'm completely equal, but then neither will he allow us to promote the gospel servant to higher status than he should have, nor will he allow us to demean gospel work. I'm God's fellow worker. And key to it all, 
only God who gives the growth, which twice is repeated. So Paul is saying, look, have you forgotten the doctrines of grace? No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again, said Jesus. Only God. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. The truth alone can set you free. Only God. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Only God. There is salvation in no other name. There is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved. Only Jesus Christ. God alone gives the growth. But there's a way of speaking and thinking about leaders or considering the churches we go to or the area of service in which we happen to be engaged that is fundamentally pagan. Just like the ugly, grotesque world. Were you in the house? I'm going to pick a number of ways in which we could be infantile in our assessment of ourselves. Please understand what I am and am not doing here. I'm categorically not suggesting that you or I have definitely fallen into this trap. I'm just suggesting areas in which one might. If we came to think we really were something because we were in a church of a particular size. If we came to think that we really were something because we attended a particular set of Bible studies. If we came to think we really were something because the church we attended had planted five churches or ten churches or uh, run a summer festival or some sort or other with a hundred churches attending. If we came to think we really were something because we attended a particular theological seminary. If we came to think we really were something because we did Cornhill Plus, Minus, or Divided. If we came to think we really were something and could strut our stuff, lording it over others, because we understood the whole Bible story. Well, who gave you any of that? Only the Lord. A silly story. It, I arrived to work here in May 1995. And uh, because I suppose there's an element of inveterate man pleaser in me, before I preached the first sermon, I was absolutely terrified. We were over at St. Andrew's at the time. You'll remember St. Helens was being done up. I came home that evening. It was the six, seven o'clock in those days. I came home that evening and just as we were going to sleep, and I didn't mean any boast, anything boastful or self-promoting about this, but I just happened to say to Janet as I was going to sleep, I've preached from the same pulpit as John Wesley. Well, I am married to a very fine woman. She had recently visited Israel and she responded quick as a flash, I have stood on the same beach as Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, don't you love the way that Paul has so finely balanced five through nine? Notice how he chooses precisely the right illustration. He's talking about the growth and that it's only given by God. He uses the illustration of the field and the planter, and he tells us he's just a manual worker, which to a Greek audience would have been very hard on the ear. They were just as snobbish about work as you are. No, it's God who gives the growth. You can't be born again without God. You can't be set free from sin without God. You can't be declared right with God Without God, you can't be sustained for one single second of your Christian life without God. You can't resist temptation without God. The very works that we do are willed and worked by God according to his purposes. And so to boast and puff oneself up and seek to build one's status over against another Christian is just anathema. I've had a very depressing January and February because I've been listening to the podcast of the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And you may have been familiar with that ministry really based around one man. And again and again and again, encouraged by him, I think, 
it seems that they began to think they really were something. It's easy to point the finger. The children's work in which I was involved over 30 years ago now has recently been the subject of investigation as a result of historic abuse by two particular individuals. For that work and those attached to it, it has been profoundly humbling. I think it is fair to say that some from those works have in the past given the impression that they really were something as a result of their connection to that particular work. Well, what were all those who worked in that work, according to Paul? Servants, errand boys and girls, Nothing, equal. To puff oneself up on the basis of external giftings and so forth, how infantile. But then you can see in 10 and 11, still under this point, a proper assessment of genuine workers, 10 and 11, the illustration changes to the building. You see, you might imagine from verses five through nine that the worker is irrelevant or that the work he does, it doesn't really matter what he does. Oh no, not at all. God uses means. And in verses 10 and 11, the picture changes from the field to the building and Paul's language is very carefully chosen here. He describes himself as a wise master architect and to the Corinthians, where wisdom mattered so much, Paul says, no, I was the wise, skilled master architect. Verse 10, according to the grace given to me, like a wise master architect, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, the Corinthians would have been able to testify to that, wouldn't they? Yeah, Paul came, he taught us Jesus, he built on that foundation. Yes, Apollos came, he taught us Jesus, he built on that foundation. There is only one foundation, if you like. Forget the human wisdom, the oratorical skill. The only thing that we can boast in with any degree of authenticity is what is founded on Jesus. And so the Corinthian church was not founded on Paul's personality or on his management skills or on his charm or on his charisma. Quite the opposite. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Oh yeah, Paul could teach the most meaty doctrine. He wrote Ephesians. But he came and gave them milk and he taught them Jesus and Apollos then came through and he taught them Jesus because the only foundation that counts is the foundation of Jesus. And so anyone engaged in gospel work, which is every single person here who is Christian, the moment you become a Christian, you become a minister, every one of us, menial laborer, Errand boys and girls, in God's field, nobody's precisely equal fellow workers with God. And we are to build on the foundation, it's God's work. Anything in it only stands as it's built on Jesus, nothing else will last. Every brick is only there as a living stone if it's connected to Jesus. Ponder as we pray for our group members, prepare our Bible studies, read one-to-one -one with our unbelieving friends. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We must take care how we build. There was a church worker called Mark Ruston. He was an extraordinarily humble man. And he worked in the church where he served for over 30 years. 
And it was built, really, from nothing to a very significant, or very little, to a very significant church in terms of its numbers and influence around the world. When it came to his retirement, I wasn't there. I'm quoting from Vaughan Roberts' book on 1 Corinthians, which is excellent, by the way. When it came to his retirement, a whole, as you can imagine, strings of people came up and grave great kind of eulogies about him. And then, I've completely lost the place, so I shall have to do it from memory. And then he got up to speak, and he said, when you borrow a donkey, you feed it some straw, and then you give it back to the master. I thank you for the straw that you've given me, and he pointed to the television that he'd been loaned. You don't thank the donkey, you thank the master. And then he sat down, and that was it. Now, you may feel that was slightly ungrateful <laughs> for the response he'd been given, but that was the attitude of Mark Ruston. Just a donkey. And that brings us to the final point, verses 12 through 13. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be made manifest. The day will disclose it. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So there is a day. And wood and hay and stubble are the stuff of ordinary earthly houses of the day, wood for doorposts, dried grass mixed with mud for walls and straw as thatch. But gold, silver, and precious stones were the stuff of God's temple. And so the play will end, the clock will stop, the curtain will fall, you will be asked to stop writing and to put your pen down, and the fire will come. The day of judgment. And you may seek earthly powers and fame. The world may be impressed by your great name. Soon the glories of life will be past, and only what's done for Jesus will last. And you may build great cathedrals, large or small. You may build skyscrapers, grand and tall. You may conquer all the failures of the past, but only what's done for Jesus will last. And so the world will boast in all sorts of absurd trivia. I got a PhD. I had these name letters before or after my name. I built such and such. I was somebody else. I was, and I'm attached to that person. You know, I was at the house. You know, I'm a chap. The world will boast in this sort of trivial nonsense. But a right assessment of ourselves and of those who serve us as donkeys, we'll ask the question, are they building on the solid foundation? Because if they're not, it will be burned up. Let me lead us in prayer. Thank you, our Father, that there is something we can do in this world that stands the test of time as your fellow workers building on the foundation of Jesus Christ in your glorious temple, the church. We ask for your forgiveness for the many times in which we have been infantile and immature and unspiritual and fleshly worldly and altogether human. We thank you for the beauty of your church where all are equal, none can puff themselves up, all saved by grace and built on Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.